Hello and welcome to Connected with Lori. We have a special guest on the computer here, Gary Gray. Gary is the communications coordinator for the city of Fort Lauderdale. Hi, Gary. How are you? Doing just fine, even with all this COVID mess going on. Oh, Gary, it's crazy. And I know you being in Florida, you must be seeing such, I mean, heavy numbers. I can only imagine what you're going through. Yeah, Dade and Broward County are really getting hit hard right now. And it's just not a pretty picture. And I hear rumors that they're going to do another shutdown. And that's just not, uh, not what I really want to see because it's so hard on the small businesses, business owners that are trying to recover and now they get hit again. I can only imagine. I know being in New Hampshire, it's you know, a little bit different. I mean, we're not seeing quite the same numbers, but we're you know, talking about mandating masks. We're talking about, you know, same shutdowns. And if this kids are going to go back to school and this uncertainty is just incredible. What are we going to do? And each day is different. Yep. Yeah. And I deal daily with our police and firefighters. They're out there on the front lines. And of course, when they have a radio issue, they bring it in for uh, us to take a look at. We're right in the middle of a complete radio reprogramming project for both our police and fire. And so we're, we're seeing these guys several times a day. And I don't know, am I going to get it again? I don't know. Oh, gosh, to have that fear all the time. I can only imagine what that's like, especially when if you've had it before, what do you think? I mean, do you get it again? Nobody really knows. No one knows what's in store for us. That's the uncertainty. I am fairly certain I had it. But at this point in time, I can't even get a, uh, a test to determine if I did have it. It's been too long. Wow, that's crazy. So Gary, you and I have been on the circuit. I know you've been inclusive to some of my panels. We've had lots of discussions. You've even helped me with a few articles written and I appreciate you. I know that we're both in this together, so to speak, to you know, alleviate some of the pain points that public safety brings as far as you know, RF signal and frequency, building the right systems for tenants and uh, making sure the right people are in place to be able to deploy. So I'm curious because you and I have had so many discussions surrounding public safety. What are some of the issues that you see today when it comes to building and building public safety systems? The biggest issue we're seeing is, unfortunately, it's people that aren't really radio-centric in their training and their qualifications. A lot of uh, small companies got into this. A lot of electrical companies got into this thinking that, oh, hey, this is just hanging stuff on the wall. We can run conduit. We've been doing this. But they don't have the RF engineering background that it takes to truly properly design one of these systems. And unfortunately, when they go to an out-of-state uh, company that does design, those companies don't understand what our buildings are built like down here in Florida. You know, we have Category 5 hurricanes that come through and our buildings have to withstand those. They're, they're not like the typical Midwest uh, construction. I'm from Michigan and I'm accustomed to uh, basically stick and lumber buildings and down here, that's not the case. Everything is concrete, steel rebar, and uh, concrete block. You know, it's different construction and it's much, much more massive. And you definitely bring up a good point. And the way we look at this from code enforcement and mandates, people that install or they integrate into the public safety field, they look for the areas where there are mandates, especially for an existing structure, like we know in your area that you have. So you're right. All of these construction companies will pick up deploy because they go to the areas where it's lucrative and there's you know, obviously lots of business to be had but they have no idea. And I see that every day because they're calling me looking for codes. What are, what are the codes in Broward County? What are the codes that are being enforced in Florida? But these codes are different. Every single area county jurisdiction. Is that right? Is that typically the, state, the case that, out there? To a large degree, that is the case. We have the overall NFPA codes and you know, the typical national codes that get brought down. Uh, although we're not using the International Fire Code here in Florida, we are using NFPA, but we're behind. We're not using the most current version of NFPA, which brings other issues into play. 
and the building people are struggling with trying to figure out what do we do? And I feel for them because it is not something that's really easy for them to figure it out. They need good people that they can rely on to get the information that's needed. And it's, it's tough. It's really tough finding somebody that's really, truly qualified. There are a few of them out there. I wish I could name names, but I can't do that. No, and that's unfortunate too, because you clearly have the best interest to want to build safety systems that are going to, you know, succeed if there's ever a tragedy, if there's ever someone that needs to use the system, you want it to work. But unfortunately, you don't really test the system until you actually need it. So you're relying on these, these people, these companies coming in, and then the authorities that have to go in and test to make sure that it's, that's working correctly. And I'm curious too, what can be changed? What do you see? I mean, obviously we know what the pain points are, but what can be changed? What are your thoughts on having the change and how can we help the authorities to make the difference out there? Education is key, but then again, I can't really expect a fire inspector to have a 20 year radio frequency education. That's just not, not gonna happen. Uh, it's not in the cards. But if I could encourage them to get with their radio people, get with the people that are running the radio system for them, engage those people in the discussions, that's what really needs to happen. Because bottom line, regardless of what the fire marshal says, if the licensee says no, that's the answer, no. Because they have the authority from the federal government, from the Federal Communications Commission, to either authorize the use of a BDA or to not authorize the use of a BDA. It's a big deal. So Gary, always when we have these conversations, we could take this so deep into discussion because there's just so much to go over. I'm gonna come back after a short break, but I want I have a few more questions, hopefully that's okay. So I'm gonna take a short break and we'll be right back. Okay. All right, welcome back. Thank you so much. So we have Gary Gray, Communications Coordinator for the City of Fort Lauderdale here. So excited again, Gary, to have you. So Gary, we're talking about um, basically the codes, the code enforcement that we see. I know that they do change. They change typically every three, three years or so. Um, where do you see that happening? I mean, is, is it gonna change anytime soon? Well, the codes are always in flex. And that is a problem for the building owners and for the companies that are trying to put these in. Now they do have an option of using the, a later code than is typically utilized throughout the state at this time. But there are some things that they need to watch out for because some of the newer codes have some parameters in there that you have to put stuff in that you didn't have to put in with an earlier code. And they may think that, oh, hey, this is great. I don't have to put conduit in. Well, maybe your local jurisdiction does require a conduit, such as what we do down here in South Florida. So just because the national code doesn't call for it, doesn't mean your local code people aren't going to call for it. So there's a lot of variability in what is being enforced, what is being asked for, and what is being done in the field. Uh, the codes, like I said, can be, you can use a newer code than the older codes but you have to get the fire marshal's approval to do so. So there's a process and there's steps that you have to take. And a lot of this stuff, the building owners and a lot of the contractors really aren't up on because it's something they've never had to deal with before. Yeah, I can imagine. And, you know, having a deployed company working in several parts of the country everybody's different. And so when they come to me because I consult for finding these codes out, they're like, we're, we're now over here. We're doing this over in Oklahoma. We need to do New Orleans. You have to be able to know that every single area and every single jurisdiction is going to follow some sort of something different from a code perspective, but it's even interpretation. Would you agree? Yeah, there's even code interpretation that takes place. And there are only certain people that can interpret that code and those people are, are specified in the ordinances for the cities and the counties and the state. Uh, in Florida, if we want a code interpretation, we have to go back to the state to get it. So we're not allowed at the local level, other than our fire marshal and the chief building official, to do any code interpretation. 
personally, I can't do it. I'm not authorized to do so. So those are things that the contractors, the building owners need to understand that there's processes, there's procedures in place that they need to be aware of. And some of them are brand new. Some of them have been there for a while, but they're all changing all the time. And that's the tough part, the constant change. And I've, I've heard it stated, the only constant in life is change. That is ever so true in the BDA world. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, being a consultant looking for these codes across the country, when people come to me, they're looking for codes that might be existing in Oklahoma, and then they're asking me to do New Orleans, and then they're asking me maybe Dallas, Fort Worth. And so when I go to these codes, they're so different. They, they are based on what they're interpreting in those local localized areas, where they're, the people that are coming to me are like, oh, I have the code for, I don't know, Boston. It's got to be the same. So it's really important for the message to be out there that they're not, and it could be based on interpretation down to the local jurisdiction. Yeah, that's very true that the codes are not the same everywhere. Not only do you have the NFPA codes, you also have the International Fire Code, and those are subject to the, the local authority having jurisdiction, the AHJ has the authority to make changes to those codes. They can make them stricter and that's fully acceptable. So you have to look at the local people, you have to talk to your local people, and those are the people you need to listen to. Just because they do uh, process A in Boston and process B where you are, they may not be the same. They may be totally different and you need to have that ability to look at the codes at the local level. Absolutely. Now also too, I know that I'm sure with COVID and what we're seeing out there, that it's really difficult to even have the resources at your level or at the jurisdiction level to be able to get our answers. I know that I'm having a challenge when I go out there and you really have to dig and you really have to know people that know what to do. But, you know, the resources must have some issues as a result of COVID. A lot of cities are putting their staffs at, at home. They're working from home. Uh, some of them are coming in every other day or every third or fourth day, but most of their work is being done from home. Uh, that makes it tough for the contractors and the developers to get a hold of these people. Email is probably the best way because there's A, a record that you made the request for the information, and B, most of the people that are working from home do have to read their emails. So there is some way to, there are ways to get a hold of these people, but with the COVID, yes, it's been, it's been tougher. It's been a lot harder. I can imagine. And I also know, Gary, too, I'm going to leave you with this one question that I'm curious about. I know that you've had some challenges being out there doing what you do. Anything come to mind as far as uh, maybe a pain point that you've seen, an example of what not to do that maybe we can tell our listeners, you know, just be careful of this? Well, we've had a couple of instances where BDA systems were put into buildings and they weren't properly designed, weren't properly installed, and they created serious problems. One of them took down the Miami-Dade radio systems, mm. and Miami-Dade has two countywide radio systems, both of them were taken off the air, and that also impacted Broward County's radio system. Just because of the noise and the trash that was being re-radiated out of this improperly designed BDA network. And that caused uh, Broward County to create a code, uh, Chapter 1, Section 118, that was developed just to address those types of issues to make sure that the developers and contractors made contact with the proper people before they started their projects. We also had an, uh, an issue here in Fort Lauderdale. Uh, just the day before a contractor was to get his turn on approval inspection, they turned their system on. And again, it took down Broward County's radio system, it took down the city's radio system. Wow. And that just is impossible to find when you're short manpower and when you just, it, it's just horrible. 
And crazy. you have police officers calling you up, screaming, my radio doesn't work, fix it now. And that's what we have to deal with. And unfortunately, some of those contractors uh, do things without the proper steps being taken. Uh, the one contractor that we dealt with here in Fort Lauderdale, uh, they've changed their ways. I bet. They They're have changed to. their ways, yeah. And I really truly hope that our messages out there will allow others to change their ways too. It's a matter of life and death. That's what we have to look at and why we do what we do on a constant basis. And some, uh, like I said, some of these contractors that don't have a radio frequency background, they don't understand what the impact can be to a public safety radio system if they turn on a BDA that's malfunctioning. Yeah. So a message to, to people out there installing the systems, a message out there to the property owners, it is critical, critical to understand the process. And there is an absolute process to being able to build public safety radio systems. Gary and Gray. The, and the ahead. biggest part of that process, mm -hmm. get your local radio people involved. The people that are running the public safety radio systems in the jurisdiction that you're working in, please, I beg you, get them involved from the get-go, from the start. They can give you a wealth of information and they are willing to help you because they don't want to see your system create problems for them. Great advice, Gary Gray. Thank you so much. You're always a wealth of knowledge. I love having you on the show. I love having this interaction. You are amazing. I'm going to ask you back. Hopefully that's okay. I will be glad to come back and help the developers, help the contractors, and help you get this message across that these are critical systems and they need to be put in correctly to keep everybody safe. Sounds like a plan. Well, thank you so much for being on my show, Connected with Lori. We will have you back here soon. Thanks, Gary. Goodbye. Bye.